welcome to today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom, and we'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Celgene, for their support of Myeloma Crowd Radio. Now, before we get started with today's show, I'd like to give just a quick update on the software tool we created called HealthTree. We now have over 4,400 patients who are using HealthTree, and you might notice the new design. In HealthTree, you can track your myeloma in a single place, your genetics, your labs, um, your prior lines of therapy, and then you can see treatment options that are personally relevant at every stage of your myeloma that you can then discuss with your doctor. You can find clinical trials you're eligible to join, which narrows, personalizes your list from about 450 open studies to about 10 to 20 that you're actually eligible to join. You can find financial help. You can answer researcher survey questions to advance insight and a potential cure. And soon you'll be able to connect with myeloma patients who have similar genetic features to you. We're also building a doctor and researcher portal to help you, your, your doctor see your health tree profile in a single place, and this will help them provide you with a second opinion if you'd like to go do that as well. So it's very important that you enter all your information and keep it updated. And once it's there, before your doctor sees your profile, we'll be validating it with you. And there are three ways to get help if you need help doing that. Well, first in HealthTree, there's a support button in the bottom right screen. You can ask your questions in that live chat window. You can also click the Help button and find a 1-800 number you can call. We also have a program called the Myeloma Coach. And you can find a coach who can help you walk through HealthTree, and they can help you with other aspects of having myeloma as well. So especially if you're newly diagnosed, you may want to um, use that program called Myeloma Coach, and you can find that on myelomacoach.org. HealthTree is also now accessible through your phone, and we continue to improve the design, and we're excited to be adding more features that are coming over to over time. Now, um, on to today's show. Creating a myeloma research center is no easy task, and the value of the myeloma specialist we have really reiterated over the course of this entire program. Um, Dr. William Matsui, formerly of Johns Hopkins, has taken on that challenge to create a myeloma lab, a research center, and a clinical practice at the new Dell Medical School Live Strong Cancer Institutes. So welcome, Dr. Matsui, for, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, let me give you a brief introduction for you before we get started. Um, Dr. William Matsui is Dep- Deputy Director of the Live Strong Cancer Institutes at the Dell Medical School of, of the University of Texas at Austin. He is Director of the Hematologic Malignancies Program, Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Oncology and Professor of Oncology. Dr. Matsui was formerly the Director of the Multiple Myeloma Program at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Can- Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and was co-director of the Division of Hematologic Malignancies at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Matsui is also a member of the Live Strong Cancer Institute's Executive Committee and many other committees at the Dell Medical School. Dr. Matsui received the Scholar in Clinical Research Award from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and the Kimmel Foundation Scholar Award at the Sydney Kimmel Foundation for Cancer Research. He has been awarded many teaching awards and early in his career received the ASCO Young Investigator Award. He teaches about cancer stem cells at the University of Texas and is deeply involved in student and mentoring students uh, that are PhD students, medical students, residents, fellows, and postdoctoral training programs. He's received many grants on the role of stem cells and has registered four patents around this topic, and we'll talk about that more in this show because these are early uh, precursor uh, myeloma cells, potentially. He is also um, associate ed- editor for the Hematology Journal, Immunolo- Immunology and Immunogenic Insights, and the Journal of Medicine, as well as an ad hoc reviewer of really um, a very long list of programs. So we are thrilled that you are with us today, um, and we're fascinated to know about um, this new program that you created. It's This is no easy feat. <laughs> No, it is not a it's it's definitely not easy and I think that um it is one of those um things where you sort of say oh you know it would be it would be so nice to have this and this and that and you know one way to do that would be to just do it yourself and that's 
an idea to go into it, and then when you're actually there trying to do it, it's you know you say to yourself, "Oh my God, I can't believe that I don't have this and that and the other thing, and I need to just <laughs> do it myself." So it has been um, a great experience up to this point. It's been, um, I think, the biggest challenge of my career um, personally, and and uh, but I think that at the same time, it's been this incredibly um, fulfilling and um, it's just been a, a wonderful thing um, getting started. Well, you came from Johns Hopkins, which has a really deep myeloma practice, and you were a director over that myeloma program. So when you think about you know things you might want to do, it's not just simply that you're moving to a new facility and becoming a myeloma specialist at a different center. You're actually creating a new clinical practice, a new laboratory, a new research center, uh, and all of that that comes with it. Right. So the you know there there are um, one thing about the school that I think is very unique is that it is um, it's a totally new medical school. It's been around for about five years. It was that was about five years ago, and it's right on the corner of the main University of Texas at Austin campus, which is like this huge um, university. And Mm -hmm. um, there are many medical schools that have been started um, more recently. And the part of it is, is that they're not necessarily affiliated with like a giant university. And so this, I thought, was a great opportunity because it's not like everything is new. There's this great academic institution here, but the medicine part of it was new. And so it wasn't starting entirely from scratch. It's more like there were things here, but they just had to be geared towards health and uh, medicine. And, and I thought that that was a, a really great place to start from. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, how do you go about creating such a center, really, from the, the ground up? So I think that there are two ways to do it. And one way is to say, okay, I'm, I have a pad of paper and I have a pencil, and I'm going to list sort of all of the things that I think – are important, et cetera. So I'm going to list, um, you know, clinical services. I'm going to list um, a clinical research program. I think there should be a basic program. Um, and you can sort of try to be an architect of doing it that way. Um, the other way to do it is to say, okay, I'm here, and what are the greatest needs um, right now? And I'll go and take care of those, and then once I start taking care of those, that as other things start to percolate, I'm going to try to address those. And so I think that really the, the differences between the two approaches are, one is, is is you're planning sort of for the long run, and then the other mm-hmm. is just saying, look, there's stuff that needs to be done now, so how do I go about doing it? And I think that it's really in the end, it's it's kind of like a balance of the two things. So coming from a place like Hopkins um, and knowing, you know, other people, um, other myeloma people who have, like, great programs, I think it's you know sort of what the components of a, a good program are. And I think that at the same time, um, you want to work towards those things, but you got to do it in a fashion that's, like, uh, being aware and responsive to the situation that you're in. So I have ideas about, like, in five years or ten years where we want to be. I think that that is a little bit of a different approach than sort of saying, look, today what do I need to do um, to try to get myself there? Because I can't just sit here and just keep planning. I need to actually do something. So it's been odd to have a balance of that. And um, that is a little bit different than at Hopkins where it was kind of like, well, here's a problem that's come up, and so you have to deal with that problem. And then here's another problem mm-hmm. that comes up, and so you have to deal with that problem. So everything is sort of established, and you're trying to make sure that all the trains are running on time. And that's really, you know, was uh, the, the biggest part of the job at Hopkins. Whereas here it's sort of like, well, where do we get the trains, and where are the stations, and how do we sort of arrange that? So in that way, like I said, I, it, it, I know the components that are important, um, and I try not to get anxious about not having them right now, 
but at the same time, I got to sort of um, figure out a plan to work towards each of those goals over, you know, months to years. Well, I would think that environment would be really nice um, and a nice uh, way to innovate because when you have to say, well, why do we have the train coming from this direction? Right. Or why, you know, it lets you reevaluate everything. For sure, and I and I think that that was one of the um, biggest draws in, in coming and looking at the place. And I think that the um, the school being new, really, you know, what it what it wants to do is it wants to be unique. And you can be unique, like at Hopkins, by being around forever, or you could be unique being new by trying to do things different. And I think that. Here, um, there's a big emphasis on value-based care, and we can talk about that. Um, and there's, um, you know, a big emphasis on trying to tie um, sort of the basic uh, science that's going on on the main in the main university over to the medical school and have it be an implied thing. So I think that it's really um, a couple of features that are pretty unique to this place that, you know, I didn't really have uh, the opportunity to do at Hopkins. Well, I think one of the unique things, too, about you um, specifically is also just your quest for curative-type strategies in myeloma. And I think sometimes there's a difference between uh, the application of medical practice and then the um, the searching for this um, thing we all want, which is a cure. Right. So that's like, you know, like that is sort of doing research and then uh, taking care of patients is really like the same balance of doing planning on something for the long run Mm -hmm. versus the short term. Like for sure, patients come and they're sick and you need to take care of them right away. And, you know, you need to use the tools that you have at hand that, you know, work. I think that Mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, our job in academic medicine is to try to make things better. And, uh, you know, I don't think that, I don't think that my um, desire to try to cure myeloma is different than any other myeloma specialist around. Like everyone, you know, if, if you right, said, look, right. we're going to put you out of business, I would say, great. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. But I think that like, you know, how you sort of go about it and addressing it, for sure, there's different of opinions and different ways of doing it and thing, people are good at some things and other people are good at other things. And so one thing about myeloma that's great is that even though I'm here, I'm in a new place, I think people have been very supportive um, in the community. And I think that, um, you know, I still feel very much a part of um, the sort of fabric of myeloma and myeloma care, even though you know, right now I'm like the only myeloma person here. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the whole myeloma, uh, all the researchers throughout the United States, it seems to be a very nice, congenial community, and everyone works very well together and likes to collaborate. And I don't know, it's just something I notice. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think it is. I think that there are um, like any sort of um, – group of people there are um there are different personalities in it and i think that um but it is a people are polite right and i think people Mm -hmm. are willing to listen and um for sure like i think that that the strides that have been made in taking care of um patients with myeloma that has been you know dramatically facilitated and accelerated by people working together. Like no one person is going to be able to to get all of those treatments up and running and figure out how we can best mm-hmm. use them. And it really takes, a, a, you know, a big group of individuals. And I think that the myeloma uh, field has done great. Yeah, I agree. Well, what is unique about the Dell School of Medicine and its ap- approach to treating patients? We, we uh, shared an article and you had mentioned – kind of a holistic view of the patient. So whether it's that or other things, that would be great yeah. for you to share. So I think that that's the biggest thing. So the whole, when the when the health enterprise was designed here at, at UT Austin, at the Dell Medical School, one of the sort of the foundations of it was in um, this area of 
uh, value-based care. So one of the things about value-based care is um, when most people hear that, like when I heard that for the first time, I thought it was completely an economic thing about how, what the cost of care was and you know, how do you sort of get the most out of the medical system for the least amount of money. And that ultimately is one benefit of value-based care, but really the, the, the way that it's thought about here at Del Med is that you're really um, addressing the needs of, of individual patients based upon what they what they exactly, you know, what they want and what they need. And so it's not like um, um, it may be that every single patient has a different goal for what they want out of their therapy. And I think that it's really trying to figure that out and addressing that um, provides value. And um, one way to do that is to think more about patients um, rather than just what is their M-spike doing or what are their light chain's doing or what's the regimen that they're on. And so I, you know, think that I'm really good at that. I'm really good at the, the taking care of myeloma. If you said, look, I have this patient with um, a 414 and they're newly diagnosed and what would you treat them with? And then would you do a transplant? I could go through that pretty easily. I think that the issues that I faced at Hopkins were that I could talk to patients about that, but if they had other issues, like it was difficult for them to get back and forth to the clinic, or if the getting treatment meant that they were going to lose their job, or they had to, you know, explain their diagnosis to their family, or their, let's say, you know, especially I think it's difficult when you have young myeloma patients who have very young kids. Like, how do you talk to them about? their disease and what about their nutritional status and exercise and spiritual well-being and all of these things. So at Hopkins, we could do the medical part really, really well um, as an individual physician. Like I could do that with my patients, but it was hard to do the other things, right? And the reason why mm -hmm. is that I'm not trained to do the, <laughs> the, the other things. Like you don't, mm -hmm. you don't want mm -hmm. me managing your checkbook because that's not what I <laughs> do the best. And so, so I think that one thing is, 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 is can you treat the entire, can, can we provide care to the entire patient up front, right? And so like at Hopkins, if these issues came up that were outside of their strict medical care, then that would be something where I would make a referral, like I would make a referral to a nutritionist or a social worker or a counselor or something like that. And then they would go see mm -hmm. that person. And then I might be able to sort of piece it all together. So here at the school, the way that our clinic is set up is that we as a team see the patient from the very outset. So if I have a new patient, patient comes in, I will see them, I'll talk to them about their myeloma, but then I'll have a bunch of other people see them so that when people come, it's a really long first visit because they might see a social worker, a psychiatrist, a nutritionist, a fertility specialist, if that's something that's important, like all of those people are in the clinic. And so we sort of triage the patient and figure out what exactly the patient needs. And then whatever needs are there, that person is going to help take care of the patient. So I provide like medical care, but I don't, you know, I am not taking care of all of those other issues where I have no training and capacity to do that. So I think that in the end, the patients feel like it's not just um, dealing with their cancer diagnosis. And I think that that's really important because like in myeloma, you are, patients are typically on chronic therapy that lasts many, many years, right? And it can right, be it's impactful. A long it, right. And yeah. so it's a chronic disease for many people. And, you know, we're sort of trained to kind of go in see a patient say, okay, well, you have cancer, so we're going to do this, and then, you know, we're done. And I think that now that patients, keep, you know, are chronically on treatment, it becomes a different situation where you have to deal with all of these things. It's not like you can put your life on hold for a couple of months to get treatment or to get a transplant or something. It's really like it affects you over a long period of time, and it affects the people around you. So can we do something for those individuals earlier rather than, you know, in, in a preemptive way, instead of waiting till something happens and then we have to address it. So that that I think has been this 
incredibly um, satisfying way to take care of patients. It is like totally different than the way we did it at Hopkins. It's not that we didn't take good care of patients at Hopkins, but I think that here, um, you know, the burden, not the burden, but, but all the responsibility to take care of the patient is not on me, right? Because I have right, because or the there patient, are other people in the because, clinic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and so I think mm-hmm. in that way, it's been great. I think people, I think patients really love it. Um, I think for most patients, it's something that they've never, ever experienced, like those who are coming from other practices. And so it's been, that has been like the best part about working here is, is that sort of innovation, I think, is is important. And I, and I think in the end, you it does become an economic argument because people who, I think, feel better about being able to do the things that they want to do um, and have goals that are aligned. I think it, 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 it's less wasteful on the medical system, right? And so you're doing things before things happen. I think that that's important. Um, and so I think in the end, it does probably save some uh, money, but I think in the end, it's, it's really much more satisfying uh, for a patient um, especially when they have something stressful like cancer. Yeah, for sure. No, this is huge because, you know, when my brother-in-law was going through his AML, the you know the fifth floor wasn't talking to the fourth floor at the yeah. at the cancer research institute, and it was very frustrating for everybody. So this it's smoothing that out. I think you might need a new name for it, maybe like integrated care or something right. like that. Because so when the you name first of the clip, said that phrase, yeah. that's that's what I. If you just yeah. think about the economics, because you hear about all these new things that are coming out, but right. So I think that the value is really, like I said, I think the value in the end is like, is it valuable to the patient, right? Mm-hmm. Not is it valuable to the the health, you know, economy, and um, right. That part of it, I think, is for sure making people feel better, <laughs> less stressed out, is always helpful. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. It affects everything. Just it affects everything. Exactly. Everything is so integrated to the patient and it's not when they come to the clinic typically. So that's a fabulous way of doing it. Um well, let's talk a little bit about the about the types of research that you're able to do. And maybe you want to describe the difference between basic research and translational research as you talk about the types of research that you're right. able to do. So I think that like at a, in a in a medical center like this, I think that they're like really sort of, um, I would say, four or five different types of research that one can do. I think that like what we do in, traditionally in cancer is probably three or four different types. Um, the basic part I think is sort of the easiest part to sort of understand, and that's like you take very 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 sort of elementary or or elemental sort of ideas that are really, really basic ideas about molecules and about how cells work, and you just study them to try to figure out, how, well, how does the system work, right? And I think that mm-hmm. there, it's it, the goal is to figure out how the system works. Um, I think that when you do, um, obviously, clinical research, it's really like, how do we set up um, experiments? The experiments are clinical trials. And how are we trying to move the field forward by testing certain things and then seeing if they clinically improve things, and then that becomes sort of the new standard. Translational research is sort of somewhere in the middle, and I think that you can have translational research that is both more like that takes place in a lab, and there's translational research that can take place in a clinic, and most of the time it bridges both things. And really the essence of it is is that the questions you ask in the in let's say in the lab if you're doing translational research are questions like well let's say that patients with myeloma tend to relapse like most of them will relapse and so you know one idea is is that if you can prevent relapse then patients should do better so why what do we know about relapse and how do we how, is there a way where we can study it and and better understand it and so i think that if you say look what I want to do is I want to study relapse. Like that's a clinically derived question, and you can try to take that and then now try to set up a system in, in the lab where you can test it. 
And then on the other side, so really, the, so in that scenario, all of the questions that you're asking are not more like, well, how does this molecule interact with this molecule? It's more like, well, how do we take this clinical question and be able to break it down so that we can study it quickly in the lab? And then if you take that information and now, you know, part of it is can you come up with either strategies to treat people or ideas about how to better, you know, break people into split people into different categories that make sense prognostically or try to figure out like what therapy is going to work for which patient like all of those things is trying to use or trying to use the ideas that that are generated in the lab and now back apply them back to the clinic and so really the translational part is like the part that I do like I would like to say that I do where you know, we have a lab, the lab studies a bunch of different things, but really it is all the questions that we ask are grounded in like, well, there's this scenario that happens in myeloma, or there's this thing that is this sort of weird thing that happens in leukemia. And so how do we make sense of that by trying to do some stuff in the lab? And then how do we get those ideas back and try them in the clinic? And that part of it, I think at a place like UT Austin, is um, it's weird because, like at Hopkins, like the clinical part was very strong, right? Because it's been established for mm -hmm. a long time. Here, the basic mm -hmm. part of it is very, very strong because it's a you know it is a a big research university, but it's it's not necessarily the um, research has not necessarily been geared as much as possible towards like health and uh, medicine and disease, so. Part of my job here is to sort of say, look, you guys are doing this stuff and have these great sort of ideas and um, concepts, and what my job should be is to try to help you take those ideas and make them into something that's useful in medicine. So that's part of sort of what we're doing now, and that is a entirely a people thing, right? Like. I, mm -hmm. I am not the basic expert, mm -hmm. but I have to talk to someone in a way that they can understand what I'm saying and I can understand what they're saying and come to some agreement about working together and have some goals that are aligned. And then I think that that's sort of how you get it off the ground. I think that, that you know, that's sort of an organic way to build a program. Like the more people you get involved, the more things you work together on, um, at some point, there's a critical mass where there are a lot of ideas that come out of that synergy. And really here at Dell, it's, it's, it's a lot of like a lot of the first part of being here was really just going and meeting with as many people as I could to figure out what they did. And did they seem like they were, you know, wanted to collaborate and work together? And that was sort of that's sort of the first phase and I think right now we're just starting to, to do things together with people and, and really get that going. But that is, you know, that's the way that we're doing it here. Like I think that if someone said, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you $500 million and build you a building and you can recruit all the people you want to do, that would be a different way to do it and it's mm -hmm. not a bad way to do it. And so if somebody wants to give us $500 million to do that, mm -hmm. we'd be more than happy to take it and build a Myeloma mm -hmm. Institute. And so I think I think that, but like I said, I think the sort of the grassroots way of doing it now, I've really enjoyed because it's, it's a lot of like fascinating ideas that people have that they just haven't thought about them in a way that may be applicable to myeloma or maybe applicable to other cancers. Yeah, that's interesting because it's this continuum of research, right? Uh, you discover something interesting about how a cell works or something, and you move it along, and then you run a, end up running a clinical trial onto it uh, about right. it with a actual practical, you know, inhibitor or whatever it is, and then you're you're having an outcome on the medical side. So, right, and then you yeah. know, if you if, if something actually works, then you need to go back and try to figure out that you know that you understand actually precisely how it works so you can make it better right so i th i think that it's you know it's a really a full circle of going back from you know from starting from the clinic and coming up with ideas for the lab and then working those things out in the lab and 
creating things for the clinic, and then you have to go and sort of validate them by going back into the lab. And so, so it's really, you know, this sort of cycle and this engine that I think once you get that up and running, uh, you know, my experience at Hopkins was is that once you get that up and running, then it, it tends to go pretty quickly. Um, and so I think that we've made pretty good progress here starting to get stuff off the ground. But it is for sure. I got here and I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Because I <laughs> like, oh, I don't have mm-hmm. any collaborators here. Uh, you know, I have to, the lab has to rebuild itself. And that was, uh, yes, a very anxious time. <laughs> Well, right. I mean, you're you're also trying to what you talked about early earlier balance research plus your clinical practice. So you're seeing patients, but you're building a lab, and then you can't do all research. So then you have to focus right. um, on what you think is the most effective. So how do you how do you balance that? That's tricky, but so perfect. Yes, for it is. Like you. <laughs> no, well, I. What I would say is that the, there are some really great, you know, there are really great role models in uh, medicine and in science who've, who've been able to, like, sort of bridge all of these things and do them all well. Um, there, there are many great people in myeloma who are able to do this. And I think that, for me, it is, um, I would say, a lot of it is just is, is trying to think uh, or to be thoughtful about what what things you put your your energy and your time into, and what things you can sort of say, look, that's that's interesting, but I think I need to like put it aside. So when I get ideas about like needing to do X, Y, or Z, I you know realize like for sure I like cannot work 24 hours a day, and but what are the most important things to get me to where I want to be in the next few years? So getting the clinical, you know, we got to see patients. So what can we do to get that going? Uh, we want to like plan for the future and have like a great, really great, robust, you know, research program. So what are the steps we need to do right now? And so I, I think a lot of it is not saying yes to everything, um, but trying to mm-hmm. be, thoughtful about if there's um, an opportunity or there's something that you need to do to be really, really sort of honest with yourself and say, look, that's an interesting thing, but I don't see how it's going to fit into my medium to long-term plan right now. And even though it sounds really cool, I I think I have to just pass, take a pass on it. Um, So a lot of it is just trying to not drive yourself crazy. And um, for sure, there are um, these crazed workaholics in, in myeloma and who get an incredible amount done and seem to do, you know, they're excellent clinicians, they're excellent clinical researchers, they're excellent lab researchers, they run big programs, they're mentors, they do all of these things and they, you know, there are individuals who do all of those things really well. And there are a number of them in the field. I don't think I'm like necessarily one of those people. Like I just don't have the energy that they have. So for me, it's really more just saying, look, does this fit into where I think we should be in the next two to five to 10 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it requires priorities, which I think is really important. Um, Let's talk for a minute about the importance of a myeloma specialist because um, as we've been meeting with patients, we've now met with hundreds, almost a thousand patients, one on one, and the data shows, and our experience shows that there's a big dramatic difference in the care that people are getting if they see a myeloma specialist versus if they don't. So Texas is a very big place, and um, <laughs> there are a couple centers I know there <clears throat> that have some myeloma specialists, but. Um, just the need to see a myeloma specialist, I think, is really critical for patient outcomes. So from your perspective, um, how how do you look at that? So I totally agree. And I think that, you know, Austin is a very, um, it's a little bit of a weird place because it's grown so quickly. So it is, yeah. you know, it is a bigger city than Baltimore for sure. Um, in Baltimore, there were probably about, a dozen really good myeloma docs, right, uh, who specialized mm-hmm. in myeloma. And here 
there's no one like that. I thought, and, and so I think that really, you know, you talk to people, like if I talk to people who are from Austin, who've been here for, you know, 50 years, they all talk about like it was a very sleepy, small college town where everyone <laughs> knew one another, and now it's this mm -hmm. huge metropolis. And so, so I think that it's really the pace of growth has outstripped sort of the medical how the medical system grows with it. So here it is really, there's, you know, not necessarily an academic program here in um, Austin for any cancer care, right? It's, it's a lot of it is through the U.S. oncology system, which is a great system. They provide great care and the doctors are very good, but it's not something that's focused on individuals. They're not people who are necessarily, the majority of them are not focused on an individual disease. And so, for me coming here, I think a big part of it was to say, look, I think that, you know, a, a great city like Austin that's growing and vibrant, um, it's it's weird that, you know, they take, you know, Austinites take so much pride in the city, but it may not be that, um, you know, like if you get sick or if you get the diagnosis of cancer, there's a huge number of patients. It's about 30% of patients who'll get their care in Houston, right? Which is about mm -hmm. two and a half hour drive. And so, mm -hmm. like, if you imagined you were getting, I don't know, RVD or something, right? And you had to go yeah. get your Velcade once a week, and it was a two and a half hour drive there and a two and a half hour drive back. Like, that is, you know, directly impacting like your life, right? And so yeah, I think right. that one of the big draws coming to Austin was is that I thought that I had some area of expertise that could be, you know, useful to the city um, to provide some care. So for, for, for me, I think being a myeloma specialist here, I think it's been great. I think people have been really um, warm and welcoming, like the other oncologists who have been here or, or who are here. And I think that um, – you know, one thing that I wanted to ensure from the very start was that I was not, you know, I was not coming into town expecting to take care of every single myeloma patient in Austin. Like, mm -hmm. I just physically could not do that. But I think that right, right. providing some level of expertise and some level of, um, you know, uh, academic thoughtfulness about how to take care of patients with this disease was something that I could do. And so just as you were saying, you know, with different, with the platforms you guys have, it's really trying to look at, well, how does myeloma taken care of on an individual basis and how much variance is there to that? And in, in Austin, it's huge. Like people take care of myeloma in a bunch of different ways. And for me, having patients, a lot of what I've been doing is seeing patients I, you know, I think that if, if someone is doing a reasonable job, a good job, and this happens the majority of time with a patient with myeloma, I would say to them, look, I think that everything is going well. And mm -hmm. what I would say is, is that I don't need to see you and give you maintenance revlimid every month. I think that what I can do is see you every probably four to six months. Um, if, you, if something happens in the meantime, then for sure come back right away. But I think that I can provide expertise at one level, but not necessarily directly be the primary care provider for that patient, right? So patients who are in practices, I think, the, you know, just about every physician wants to take care of their own patients. And I think that if there are, um, if, there, if they continue to do that, I can provide some, um, you know, help if help is needed. But I think that really by, by doing that, I think that over time, maybe what we can do is, is create a more uniform way that we, t that we take care of patients in Austin. That it's not like mm -hmm. one practice does X or one practice does Y. Like if there are differences, then we should talk about those differences and figure out why are there those differences and what does the data tell us and how should we sort of approach this. And so for me, it's been more like, you know, the, the goal is to not – have a giant myeloma center that has thousands of myeloma patients. The goal is to make every myeloma patient treated the best that they can in the city of Austin, right? And yeah, I, right. I, don't, I can't do that by taking care of every single patient, 
I just physically can't do that, but I can do that more by seeing patients and then, you know, we talk about sort of what is out there, what trials are there, and 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 that is the way I think you can provide expertise. I think it's really important to have at least a visit with an expert. And uh, it's not that people don't know what they're doing who are non-experts. It's just that myeloma, you got to imagine, you know, 10 drugs in 10 years, right? It's hard to keep yeah, up it's complicated. with what's going mm-hmm, on. It is. And if you are treating, you know, breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, sarcomas, and then you're treating myeloma, I like if I you know, I can barely keep up with the myeloma literature. And if I had to do that for 10, 20 different diseases, there'd be no way I could do that. And so I think that that's what I try to provide is kind of a contemporary look at, well, if you have myeloma, this is sort of what we do these days, right? This is the approach that we mm-hmm. might take, and these are the options, rather than saying, well, like 10 years ago, you know, you know, we would have done something different, but maybe like, you know, giving you thalidomide right now is probably not <laughs> the best thing. There are other mm-hmm. things that you could use. So it is, uh, like, like I said, I'm trying to improve the consistency of care in Austin, and I think that, you know, hopefully be a friendly face that people say, look, you know, I have this patient. I'm not really sure what to do with this patient. Can I run it by you? Like, I would love to be that person. Um, But it's not Mm -hmm. necessarily that I have to take care of every single patient around. Um, There are good docs everywhere, and so I think that they they should definitely, you know, take good care of their patients. Right, and that's a very effective strategy. I think that that happens a lot in myeloma. And you consult with the myeloma specialist when you're diagnosed, so you get started in the right direction, and then when you relapse, because you have to make another treatment change right. or some key decisions. So those key decision time points, I think, are the most important times. Exactly, and so I think that that, and, you know, and that's really one of the reasons why, like, in our clinic, like, I'm, you know, I'm as important as, the nutritionist. I'm as important as a social worker. I'm as important as a psychiatrist because all of those things need to be taken care of. But if someone's on maintenance, you know, I don't know how many times you want to talk about relevant maintenance when you're on maintenance. Um, and there may be other things that, you know, we can help you with besides filling your relevant prescription. So I think that that's, right, right. as things become more chronic, there are other issues that come up, and we want to make sure we take care of those issues, not just focus on, you know, for some patients, for sure, their myeloma is the least the least of their problems. Um, mm-hmm. But we want to, you know, we want to take care of the, the entire person. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, let's transition for a minute to mm-hmm. kind of more um, – practical application of this new approach, this holistic care approach, but also innovation because Austin as a city is a very innovative city and they pride themselves on a lot, on a lot of um, entrepreneurship and innovation. So I'm sure you're catching the, the vibe there as well. But mm-hmm. there's a ton of innovation coming out in myeloma. And the immunotherapies and the newer therapies like Selenexor and Isotuximab right. and um, personalized therapies and using minimal residual disease. So when, as you're looking at creating this new practice, which ones do you pick? Uh, which ones are the most interesting to you? And because you'll have to create clinical trials and things like that, right. that open at your center. So how do you prioritize those things? And, and maybe we just pick one that you want to talk about the most and we just, you know, work our way through some of those. Right. So I think that, like, in a very broad level, I think that, you know, in terms of, of you know, one of the major roles that a myeloma center plays is providing therapies that are not standardly available, right, or doing clinical mm-hmm. trials that are helping move the field forward. And I think that, that – um, it is, uh, you know, to do clinical trials, you need patients, right? And I think that mm-hmm. the one thing that you want to do is, um, like right now, you know, people, for sure, we've been approached about um, a number of trials. And for me, I think a lot of it is just waiting and seeing what kind of patients we have. Like, I, I don't want to 
open a trial where there are no patients that are able to go on it, right? And so mm-hmm. I think that you're, you know, you're as, uh, in in addition to advancing the field, what you're doing is you're providing a service to myeloma patients because clinical trials is a super should be a super important part of every myeloma patient's you know treatment. Like at least thinking about a clinical trial or hearing about trials because that's how you start to think about like what are the standards and how are they going to change and you know what's the right approach for me now and how might that be different? How was it different than before and how might it be different? moving forward. So for me, a lot of it right now is just to see what kind of patients we have. And um, once we get sort of, you know, a census of patients who are either relapsed or newly diagnosed or in the post-transplant phase, then we can now start thinking about like, well, we have this patient population, you know, maybe what we can do is we can, we can devise or find a clinical trial that's going to serve that population of patients, and we know those patients are there, so we'll be able to to pull it off. So I think part of right now is to sort of it's it's, it's the component of doing what's needed, and to figure mm-hmm. out on the clinical research side what's needed. You got to figure out well who are the patients, um, where are they in their treatment, uh, what things do they need? Um, do you need a lot of relapse refractory trials? I think that that that's always a place where academic centers have been very active. So I think that's that thinking about like novel approaches, novel drugs, I think that that is especially when people have have unfortunately gone through most of the standard therapies, I think that's an important role that an, an academic myeloma center plays. So I think that that's mm-hmm. probably what we'll center on and um you know, I'm hopeful that we get some trials up within the next 6 months. Um, mm-hmm. But it's really a way of, of kind of, like I said, like it doesn't make sense for us to have a smoldering myeloma trial when I've only seen one smoldering myeloma patient. Um, right, and that makes sense. So, so I think that's that's one way to do it. I think that as far as the, um, you know, what are the exciting clinical strategies, there are a ton, right? And and myeloma is one of those things where you say to yourself oh, my God, there's like, okay, we have all of this. I don't know what we can do any better, right? And then <laughs> all mm-hmm. of a sudden there's a whole wave of new things. And so, you know, like like with most other uh, disease specialists, I think, you know, how the immune system works is a very – it may be a way of actually controlling the disease in a, in a very meaningful way. And, you know, I, we've talked before about um, allotransplantation, and really allotransplantation is like the first immunotherapy that was really clinically useful was doing allogeneic bone marrow transplants in patients with a number of diseases. And so that actually provides the, you know, the proof that the immune system can control myeloma, right? And so now mm-hmm. the question is, is can we do that in safer ways or ways that are, you know, more... Um, uh, effective than doing allotransplants. And that, I think, is sort of the next phase. I I think that, you know, the immune system is still, it's, it's, it's like every kind of therapy. It's like it's a little bit uncontrollable, right? And I think that, that the questions of how do you do it, how do you do it safely, all of that, especially, you know, like in lymphomas and leukemias, patients can get very sick from CAR T-cell therapy. It doesn't seem like it's as big an issue in myeloma, but it can still be very much an issue. Um, I think that that's important. And, and and I think that once you start exploring, you know, an approach like immunotherapy, then it becomes important to try to figure out, well, if it doesn't work for everybody, then why is that the case? And then you can improve upon Mm -hmm. it and make the strategies better. So I think immunotherapy is important. I am not necessarily a tumor immunologist, um, but I think that that's got to be one thing that you think about. um, uh, You know, it may not be the forefront of what you do, but I think that that's something that um, holds a lot of promise. So So if you said, look, what kind of things would you like at your center, I, I would say, look, I think that immune-based approaches that are not readily available standardly 
those would be, you know, I think a pretty attractive thing to start working on. Um, but I think that that really, like I said, I think it, it's trying to sort of say, look, what, what is the sweet spot in terms of um, who are the patients, what are the needs of, of the community, um, what can we like feasibly and safely do here, and um, you know, in the end, are we contributing? Right? Are we contributing to uh, the field of myeloma? Are we contributing to the health of the city? Um, and then, most importantly, are we like contributing to you know the health of our our individual patients? So I think if you could tick mm-hmm. off all of those boxes, then I think you're in the right place. Um, but it's you know, it is, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot to get to that. Yeah. Place. But I, th- but I oh, think we'll yeah. get there sooner rather than later. Well, let's talk a little bit about your stem cell research too, because mm-hmm. we talked about that on a prior show and maybe you want to explain that to listeners, what that, that research means and is, but now that CAR T development is a little further along and I see them starting to do these, dual CAR-T studies mm-hmm. like targeting BCMA and CD19 together, um, and there are some other targets that are happening. Um, and there are also, there's also other research that are targeting the stem cells. What What's the status of that um, in terms of myeloma, in terms of, like, preventing relapse or right. killing it all when you're right. when you're going after it? So this is like, you know, when we've talked before, like this is a hugely controversial area. And I think mm-hmm. that like I, you know, I think that if if the research that we do has been, you know, criticized, it's really this is like the critical component of it. Right. And I think that it is um, if you sort of say, well, why is that? Is the concept not hold in the you know, is it not really a, a concept across oncology, or is it something specific to myeloma? So if you talk to people in in, in the the fields of AML, right, they'll say, look, you know, we got to get rid of the leukemic stem cell if we're ever going to cure patients. And so there, it's very deeply embedded in the way people think about it. In terms mm-hmm. of like myeloma, I think that people intrinsically realize that most patients relapse, and then there's some reason why they're relapsing and it, it's probably that not every single cell every single myeloma cell has the ability to regrow and to reproduce the tumor and that's what's causing relapse it's got to be some specialized population of cells so the controversy in in myeloma is really like what does that cell look like right so mm-hmm. if you think very you know at a very sort of um, simple level at, at at a cell, there are two things about it that I think are very evident. One is, what does it look like, right? Does it look like a plasma cell? Does it look like a B cell? What does it sort of resemble? And then the second thing is, is what does it do, right? And so in the field, right, the controversy mm-hmm. is, what does it look like? That is the main controversy, and that was like, you know, and and what I think is is that it looks different in every single person. Um, it looks different depending on if you're newly diagnosed versus if you're multiply relapsed. It looks different if you have a 17P than if you have a 414, right? So all these factors go into how it looks, right? So the, I think part of the frustration in the field is that well, we don't, you know, that that what it looks like, its phenotype is not the same. It's not stable, right? And so mm-hmm. one way to, to, to deal with that is, is that, well, you in each patient you catalog what every cell looks like and figure out sort of what each one can do. Or the other thing you can do is you can say, look, I don't care what it looks like, right? I care what it does, right? So I think mm-hmm. that for us, like the controversy in the field, and I totally get this, is what does it look like? And that's important for approaches like using CD19 or anti-BCMA because you need to target the proteins that are characterizing it, right? That's what it looks like. But 
you're, you're not targeting the function of CD19. You're not targeting the function of BCMA. You're just targeting, you're using those proteins as a way of getting the immune system, the CAR T to the cell. So mm -hmm. another way to think about it is, it's like, what is the unique function of these cells? Well, one is that they got to last, they got to hang around after you give someone chemo, including a transplant, because if you got rid of them, then you would never relapse. So they have this ability to survive the chemo and persist. The other is, is that they have this ability to, to, to start growing again, right? And they can do that for long periods of time. Like they can remain dormant for a long period of time and come up. So that property is pretty special. And if you think about like other tissues we have in our body, like the bone marrow, it is only a few cells that are able to do that. So in myeloma, one of the things we've done is to try and, like, I think it's great to, to do these, like, dual targeting things if you're looking at what the cell looks like. I'm more interested in, like, what are the processes that make the cell do what it's going to do, right? Like, what is its function? Right. Like, the, the, the function of the cell is what causes all the problems. It's not what the cell looks like. And so right, that makes what sense. we've been doing is really just focusing more on, like, what are the pathways or what are the things about the cell that allow it to, like, persist over time and to what triggers it to start growing again, what allows it to survive chemotherapy. And I tend to think about things that way. Like I said, I, I think that the function is what causes health problems. I don't think it's what the cell looks like. And and plus, it's hard to tell, it's hard to, to, to do things based upon what the cell looks like if it looks different in every single person. So right. really, it, it's so for me, it's like this functional argument. And that is, I think, somewhat irritating to people in the field because mm -hmm. you want to know what it looks like. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, and I, Tell people, look, I don't know. I I think it depends. It depends on the on you know stage of disease, genetic mutations, you know your what you've been treated with, all of these other things, and I can't tell you. And so, what I can tell you is what what it probably does. And so let's try to figure that out. So that's been my approach, and um, that I think has been irritating to people. Um, <laughs> because we originally found that things with CD19 we thought were important. And I still think that mm -hmm. that's true in some patients, but not all patients. Um, mm -hmm. And But like I said, I think that you got to figure out what it does, um, and that's how you can move the field forward at this point in time. Like arguing about what it looks like I think is it's a point. Well, it's going to take forever, argument. right? I, exactly. It'll it'll take forever because then you have to catalog catalog everything that you might have to. I mean, a patient with like three different genetic mutations now has to find the matching exactly. three different inhibitors, and it's like personalized medicine on steroids. You know, like now you're on five medications that might potentially hit part of that clone or whatever. I don't know. Right. It so I think seems, it's, I think the, it's like taking yeah. a, mm -hmm. a step back and just saying, look, what are we concerned about within the concept? The, the, what we're concerned about is people relapsing. So let's deal with right. that. Let's not perseverate over what is the markers on it. Um, mm. uh, look, let's, you know, let's, let's think clearly here about what our goal is. Um, and that's how I think we should move it forward. Well, that's a very practical approach and probably faster. <laughs> uh, and, well, when you think about immunotherapy, sometimes that's what's happening. Like you'll apply these immunotherapies, and it doesn't matter what genetic mutations are on the cells. Um, if you can figure out what's – and it might even be just the status of someone's immune system, or it could be so, something else. So can I totally. ask you just a, strat a strategy question? Because mm -hmm. I've – a lot of been talking to a lot of different patients about what they're picking for treatment options, and and um, sometimes I'll chat with them before they talk to their doctor about different strategies, mm -hmm. and even for myself personally. And you think about it, these immunotherapies are coming into these past the phase one stage, whether it's CAR T or whether it's the bites or the antibody drug conjugates and things like that. And it seems like overall it's easier to get these therapies or they're more effective if you get them earlier. 
if you have right. this huge arsenal of drugs that you can go back to, you have pomelist and carfilzomib, and maybe you go back to cytoxin or whatever, um, wouldn't it be better to try these immunotherapies in the, a, a clinical trial earlier rather than right. exhaust everything that you currently have and then go, oh, well, maybe I'll try an immunotherapy now that I've been on 10 lines of therapy. You know, like this, it, to me, this myeloma thing is like a chess game. And right. Like I, I, I totally and, agree with you. I, I think that the most effective things you got to use the earlier, like the earlier you use the most effective things, I think the most bang for your buck you're going to get out of them. And I think that if there are things that are potentially curative, they're going to be potentially curative in in more people the earlier you do them earlier, yeah. than, uh, you know, at the after you've, you've been through multiple, multiple therapies. And so I think that that move is happening, um, you know, in large cell lymphoma, they're doing trials now. Like typically if you relapse with lymphoma, you go and you do a transplant. And what they're uh-huh. doing is there's a big trial randomizing a transplant versus CAR T cell therapy. So it's really like second line therapy there. And I think yeah. that that'll be interesting. And, and in myeloma, you know, I've been telling people that it may be that instead of doing a transplant, you know, you get RVD and then do a transplant. Maybe what we should do is do RVD and do CAR T cell therapy, right? With the right CAR T cells. Right. But that uh-huh. may be the best bang for your buck. And it, you know, it's going to work better the less cancer you have, right? And so that makes sense. So if you give someone induction therapy and then give them something, that's going to work better. So I think I, I think that 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 move will happen. And like everything, it just takes a little bit of it, – it takes some time, and it's got to be a very systematic way of getting it there. But I I have, you know, very little doubts that immunotherapy is going to be something that people get very, very early on in their treatment. Um, and that will, I think, you know, have have a, a big, big impact on the outcome of, my, of myeloma patients. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. It's just – it's so difficult to make these decisions, and I always recommend that patients just go discuss it with their doctor. But For as sure. they're evaluating these different options, you're just thinking, well, you could go through the next two or three lines of therapy when you start relapsing and failing certain things, even core drugs like daratumumab or or Revlimid or Velocator or Exasmib or whatever it is. And you just kind of can see that pattern maybe potentially happening. Right. You think, well... Maybe it's worth it to just go, right. I, you know, if it's out of a phase one, you're testing safety and dosing, but maybe it's in a phase two, and, you know, why not? I don't know. Right. It, is there any and reason I, and I think why that, not? <laughs> well, 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 I think that part of that is is that it is really, you know, like like one thing that I will say is that, you know, there's a lot of thoughts about, and, and there's thoughts here about using, like, artificial intelligence to help make medical decisions, and mm-hmm. I am a person that says, well, that can be helpful, but it's never going to be definitive. And part of it is is that right. people are different. People look at things different ways. And, like, when people ask, well, what is your, your the biggest job you have? Like, what do you do the most for patients? I say, look, it's really just like talking to people and saying, this is where you are. This is how you got here. These are the options for you. And this, this this is the plus and minus of the options, and wh- what sort of makes sense to you, right? And if I talk to someone for 15 minutes, you know, half an hour about their myeloma, what they've been on, how they've done with that, I can pretty much guess what would be the best approach for them. There's there's almost never a a 100% or, or, or a decision that has only one solution. And so, mm-hmm. really, it's it's trying to match up. Like, I think personalized medicine is really, like, what makes sense to you, right, to mm-hmm. some extent mm-hmm. a, a, at this phase. And my, like I said, my job with patients is to say, look, is to explain things and say, this is what is going on. This is what we have available. You know, these are the options. And, you know, for you, I think that these might be things that I would think about. And, and I think that that's, that's the approach I try to take with people. Like people are really smart these days and they have a lot of information coming in, but I think that they don't know sort of what option is best for them. So you have to walk them through that decision. 
And that mm-hmm. is really like pros and cons. You know, I, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I think you cannot get a computer to do that at this stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, tying that back to what you were talking about earlier when you were thinking about, well, we don't really necessarily have to worry about what it looks like, but how it's functioning, why it's re- why we're re- relapsing. What um, what research or um, initiatives do you think are going to be the most effective at addressing that function? I think it's really like coming up with really good ways of measuring that function, right? So if you have, you know, mm-hmm tests or things in the lab, assays in the lab that really point to those things, now you can start testing different things and seeing if you can inhibit that function. So right now, I think the the biggest thing is trying to come up with ways of, of you know, accurately measuring those functional properties. It's not, it's not just having, does the cell grow or not? It's like, does it grow over, you know, time, right? That's a different way of thinking of it. So it's really like, right now, I think it's developing good assays so you can test a bunch of things um, to do it, and and that is 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 trying to test you know a function. So that's sort of I think where the field should be, um, and you know I, th- I think we'll get there. I think we'll get there, and then mm-hmm. there's ideas about what things we should test and what things we should look at, and then I think we can take it from there. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, I've uh, okay. I've monopolized all the time. Um, <laughs> we may have time, time for just one question. So, if you have a question for Dr. Matsui, you can call three four seven six three seven two six three one, and press one on your keypad. And I might just take one one caller question. Okay. So we have someone five five eight eight one six three. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Dr. Matsui. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm great. Uh, yeah, just one question for you. I've started seeing some research, I think it came out of New York, about the microbiome, about the mm-hmm. microbiome and that patients with healthy gut bacteria might respond differently to treatment. Do you have an opinion on that at all? I think that it's probably true. Like, you know, the adage of you are what you eat is kind of <laughs> like that to some extent. The um, microbiome is more things than just the gut, but, you know, it's it's got to affect, they have to affect the human body, right? So I think that the, the challenge right now is figuring out um, of all the different creatures and critters that, you, you know, you're symbio- symbiotically living with, which things are good, what things are bad, and how are they interacting with things? And so... It is, it's back to the stage, like, you know, in the beginning when we were, we were thinking about, like, sequencing genes, of sequencing, like, you get millions of pieces of data, and then what do you, how do you make that into something? And I think that with the microbiome, we're kind of at that stage of being able to collect the data, and now we can sort of generate ideas about, well, what should we try to change, and how should we test that? So I think we're going to get there. I think it is important, but I think that right now, um, it's just too much information to be able to synthesize and to come up with, I think, um, strategies where you kind of know what you're doing. But I think that that will be the case um, in the future. I think that the microbiome is going to be pretty important. Okay, Awesome. Actually, I also do have a follow-up question. Um, You were talking earlier in the interview about using – about the challenges of creating a new specialist center, right? I was wondering, how do you use technology and leverage it effectively to maximize your time as a specialist across multiple across multiple patients and across um, multiple doctors? So I think it's really that is evolving, right? Because medicine is a people-based business, um, and having technology in that, I think, is like for us, we do a lot of um, patient surveys to make sure that we're addressing the right things with patients and then that we have the right approaches so we can alter them if we need to to better serve our population. And that is really technology-driven. So the way we collect data on patients is all based on technology. It would be impossible to do it by hand. Um, we're trying to do things like do more sort of um, telemedicine-based things where you don't have to go to a doctor. You know, you can get your 
you know, you can interface with your physician and the medical team through apps and stuff like that. So we're, we are trying to do those things, which I think will make it easier. But in the end, you know, a lot of being a physician is like talking to a person. And that part, I think, is, is you have to figure out what parts of that you need to keep and what parts you can, like, sort of try to streamline through technology. But for sure, I think we're in better shape now than we were five, ten years ago. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thanks for your questions, and thanks for the great answers. Okay, one more question, 9901090. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Dr. Matsui. Um, this is uh, Greg with the Myeloma Crowd. Uh, I, I attended a, a, a clinical meeting a couple of weeks ago, and Dr. Anderson uh, made a comment about phase three trials, that they're basically too large and take too long to complete. And then Dr. Loneal, after that, mentioned that phase three trials are not really relevant in his decision-making process with with patients. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that about – do you think the phase three, the, the current clinical trial structure is relevant to a field like myeloma where we're constantly stratifying patients out by their biological characteristics? I, I, think it, I think you can design trials in a way that take advantage of those sort of individualized things about people. I think that the one thing about phase three trials that is important Right, and I think that this came up recently in um, the testing of a drug called venetoclax. Is that what we wanted? What most people, I think, would not argue with in the end is that you want people to live longer, right? And that's really an overall survival endpoint. And in the venetoclax study, that was a combination study. If you add venetoclax to, to other chemotherapy, you get more people get responses your progression-free survival or the time it takes before you um, relapse, essentially, is longer, but the patients lived a shorter amount of time, right? So that doesn't make all make sense. And so if you do shorter trials and you do them where there's no control arm, it's very difficult to know in the end, are you making an impact on overall survival? And the reason why I think that overall survival is important, you know, like for me, overall survival is the most important thing. And I think that that's why I study myeloma stem cells, because I think the stem cells are responsible for how long you live overall. And so I think that, that phase three trials do have some role in terms of establishing, um, you know, definitively to some extent, what is going to be, what should be the standard, right? What is going to make you live, a, a, a population of patients live the longest? That should be the standard. And if you do everything off of these sort of earlier endpoints like progression-free survival, at some point you're going to make a mistake. And I think that you don't want to establish that as the standard and have people live shorter. So I think that there is a role for phase three trials. I think that phase three trials, it's not that they're, they're difficult to do in myeloma. There are a lot of great phase three trials done, but I think that they need to be done thoughtfully. And I think in the future, just as you're saying, they need to take into consideration things like specific molecular um, abnormalities that people might have and MRD and all of these other things. But for sure, you can, you know, you want to have people live longer. And to do that, you need to study overall survival. And really, like, the only meaningful way to do that is in randomized trials, which tend to be phase three trials. So I think they do play a role. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. Great. Okay, we have one more question. Do you have time? Yeah. Or we could do it offline if you want. Okay. Um, caller 9870622, go ahead with your question. Hello, Dr. Matsui. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. I was at that same conference with Greg uh, that he just mentioned, <laughs> and which was really wonderful. Um, and there was a lot of conversation about looking at the bone marrow microenvironment and the immune system, trying to identify more specifically, and this is my language, which deficit different people have um, that's allowing relapse or, and or drug resistance so that immunotherapies could be better matched up to them. 
do you think that's like a compatible concept with also looking for stem cells? Uh, it seems to be a different avenue. Could could you kind of comment on those two things? Yeah, I think that like the environment, you know, is super important in probably like many facets of the disease. And so we we and other people have shown that um, cancer stem cells are deeply affected by their environment. It, it, you know, it makes total sense because normal stem cells are completely reliant on their environment to tell them what to do. And um, in the same way, you know, the environment affects things like um, how cells respond to different drugs, how the immune system is working well or not. So I think that the the, the environment is something that hopefully is is something you can you can modify and modulate to make things better. Um, whether or not we can understand it in a meaningful way is a challenge. I think that that you know we don't have I think great lab models to try to figure out what's going on like that are really super accurate in terms of uh, telling us what's happening in patients. But I think that those will get better over time, and I think that understanding, you know, how everything integrates together, how do stem cells react to the microenvironment, and what effect does it have on the immune system, and then what effect does it have on drug sensitivity or resistance, all of those things are kind of connected up in some way. And right now what we do is we study each one in isolation, but at some point I think you've got to merge the concepts together. and. You know, we're starting to try to do a little bit of that. Okay. Okay. And uh, part two is a study just was published by um, a group of about 10 doctors, and some of them are at the University of Iowa, and they were talking about the myeloma cells that are CD24 plus, mm-hmm. and they are like tumor initiating cells, which I think are like stem cells. Yep. Um, and they tried. Um, a monoclonal antibody against CD24, and it was effective. I don't think they didn't do some patients, I don't think. Um, can, you, do, can you comment on that? Do you think that's a, a pathway to, you know, keep going down? I, I, th- I think it is. I think that, that on one hand, for sure, people have been studying CD24. There was a big paper out from a group in California where not in myeloma but in other diseases they showed that targeting CD24 was really effective at modulating how tumor cells interact with the environment, uh, especially the immune environment. So I think that people are on to already targeting CD24 outside of this finding in myeloma. So I think you could bring the CD24 concept into myeloma pretty easily. I think that the issue I have with like this CD24 paper is that it's not. it was well done. Um, the group is very good in, in Iowa. The problem is, is that it's it's – it's focusing on what the cell looks like, right? And so yeah. this is the mm-hmm. issue of like, is, is it CD or does every cell that has CD24 a tumor initiating cell or a stem cell? Are there cells in there in a person or amongst different patients where the tumor initiating cells don't express CD24, right? So I think that that this whole thing about what does the cell look like is a concept that we should get over. Right, we should, we should get like, we should get over what they look like. We should focus on what they do, and I think mm-hmm. that 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 might be a way to think about it. I like I said, I, I liked the paper. I thought it was well done. Um, I thought conceptually it was novel, but this fixation on what do the things look like is basically what's dragging down the field. I think. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think I can. Probably say that if you were to develop a clinical trial trying to define how they, these stem cells function, a lot of people would come to Austin for your trial. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. We would love to have that. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for your question. Thanks. And Dr. Matsui, thank you so much for going over time. I'm so sorry we went over so no long with you. But I really, really appreciate you joining us. Um, I think what you're yeah, doing in again. Austin is fantastic. And we hope that you have a successful clinic and research uh, project and lab. And anything we can do to help support you, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate being able to come on and, and talk about what we're doing. 
Yeah, well, it's very exciting work. So we're just so thankful that there are people out there like you. <laughs> um, we <laughs> were, yeah, as a myeloma patient, for sure. Well, thank you so much for listening to Myeloma Crowd Radio. Uh, we invite you to tune in next time to learn more about the latest in myeloma research and what it means for you. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.